There we go. Now we let everybody in, right? I already did. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so it's now 1030. Let's wait till it ends. The last slide. Shelly, take it away. Oh, you're muted, Shelly. Shelly, <laughs> you're muted. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> These little snafus, sorry about that. Good morning, everybody, sorry. And welcome to From Bambi to Thumper, an integrated strategy for the management of vertebrate garden pests. Learn how to use integrated pest management or IPM to identify and control garden damage from squirrels, gophers, deer, and other pests. This virtual workshop is presented by the Master Gardeners of Placer County. My name is Shelley Whitehead and I will be your moderator today. As you saw on our opening slides, this talk is being recorded and will be available on your YouTube web on our YouTube website after it has been unloaded, uploaded. The link to the accompanying resources can be accessed at our pcmg.ucanr.org website. Again, if you have questions during the talk, please post them to the chat and our presenters will answer them at the end. Now I'd like to introduce our great Master Gardener presenters today, Lauren Pfeffer and TC Markle. Lauren, we'll start us off, so take it away, Lauren. All right, well, good morning and welcome to Vertebrate Pests Around the Home and Garden. Let me just get my slideshow started here. There we go, you should be able to see that. And uh, I'm with the Placer County Master Gardeners. Uh, we are community volunteers that have been trained and certified by the University of California to provide home gardeners with research-based information so that you can make informed home gardening decisions. We can help you with a whole variety of problems, vegetable gardening, landscape plants, your lawns. So if you have any gardening questions, just give us a call. Uh, you can also submit questions to us uh, electronically if you go to our website. If you just Google Placer County Master Gardeners, we're very easy to find. We also have social media presence. We have uh, online publications that you can sign up for. And we have our annual gardening guide and calendar, which has excellent uh, gardening uh, information uh, tailored to the local Placer County uh, area. You would normally see us giving workshops like this at public venues like uh, libraries and things like that. You'll see us having booths at the farmer's market, uh, fairs and festivals. We put on a garden fair usually in April and then our annual Mother's Day garden tour in May. But of course, all that's on hold for now. So we're doing these uh, online uh, webinars. So let's get started. Here's the UC uh, definition for vertebrate pests, but it's basically uh, any critter that's uh, giving you trouble. For home gardeners, usually that means they're eating your fruits and vegetables, they're uh, gnawing on your ornamentals, they may be invading structures, destroying infrastructure like electrical cables and uh, irrigation lines. Like management of insects and uh, bacterial and fungal diseases, we recommend an integrated pest management approach when it comes to uh, vertebrates. An integrated pest management approach takes into account all the variables at your control and all the knowledge that you can gain about that pest so that you can maximize your chance of success and minimize any damage uh, to the environment. One important uh, principle of IPM also is trying to use the least toxic method first and then proceeding onward. It's usually a better strategy to tolerate low levels of pest damage rather than trying to achieve perfection. Because to do that, 
requires huge amounts of effort, cost, and toxicity. So keep that in mind when you see pest damage. Decide first whether or not it's anything that you really need to do anything about. So here's information, for example, about ground squirrels uh, that we have. So you can uh, you know when they're active, what they're eating at different times of the year, and then the various management strategies and how effective they are at different times of the year. So we have this type of information for many, many different pests and uh, it can be very useful for you. If you take nothing else away from this presentation, I would like you to remember that UC IPM pest notes exist in the world. If you just Google UC pest notes, it will take you to a long list of pests, each of which has extensive information about that pest and how to manage it. You can see at the bottom of the slide is an example of a pest note. So these are super useful. The other important point is to make sure that you correctly identify the pest that's giving you trouble. Just because you see a mole in your garden doesn't necessarily mean that the mole is the one that's chewing on your tomatoes. So just uh, make sure you correctly identify the pest first of all. All right, well, let's start with ground squirrels. Um, so there's just one species of these in California. They live in extensive underground burrows and a big social network. Uh, they cause the same kind of damage that pretty much all these rodents do. Rodents like to chew on things. So they will eat fruits and vegetables. They'll chew on uh, the bark of trees. You can see down at the bottom picture, uh, if that bark gnawing goes, goes all the way around the circumference of the tree, that's called girdling and that can kill the tree. Also the uh, burrows that they create can cause trouble uh, managing uh, turf grass areas. Here's an example of a ground squirrel burrow on the right there, there's a picture of it. And uh, keep this in mind, because as we go through these various rodents, identifying the burrow opening uh, correctly will help you correctly identify the pest. So for ground squirrels, uh, this burrow is not plugged with a plug of soil, it's open. And there's really not much in the way of excavated soil out around the burrow opening. So uh, keep that in mind. The ground squirrels like to uh, build their burrows kind of on the edges of things, the edges of fields along fence rows and roadsides. So that's where you can, can look for these. Now there's also tree squirrels. So it's important to make sure that you know which squirrel it is that's giving you trouble uh, to uh, correctly uh, manage it. Now tree squirrels have bushier tails uh, than ground squirrels. And uh, another easy way to figure out if you have tree squirrels or ground squirrels is to just chase the squirrel and see where it goes. If it's a tree squirrel, it's gonna run up a tree. If it's a ground squirrel, it's gonna duck into its burrow. Uh, there's other differences between uh, ground and tree squirrels. Uh, tree, ground squirrels usually hibernate during the winter. So you usually won't see them out uh, in the winter whereas tree squirrels remain active year round. Ground squirrels also may go through a period of reduced activity during the height of summer, during the peak heat uh, periods. This is called estivation, and they may retreat to their burrows until the, the heat breaks. Uh, tree squirrels cause very similar damage to ground squirrels. Uh, they, they do also dig in the ground. They don't make burrows, but they will bury food, usually in the fall, and this is called caching. Now, tree squirrels are special among all the other animals I'm gonna talk about today from a legal status because tree squirrels in California are considered game animals. That means that you need a hunting license and you can only take them or kill them during the hunting season, which in California usually runs from September to January. So right now we're not in tree squirrel hunting season. Um, so it's very important that you correctly identify which squirrel uh, and which type of tree squirrel that you're dealing with, because there are exceptions to that. Ground squirrels don't have this legal requirement and the Eastern fox squirrel, the one on the left upper picture, does not require any special permits to control at any time of the year. And this is the one that usually causes the most difficulty. 
The Eastern Fox and Eastern Gray, the top two squirrels are introduced species. Uh, the bottom left, the Western Gray, and then the bottom right, Douglas Squirrel, those are two natives. The Douglas Squirrel usually lives up in the Sierra at higher elevation, so it's usually not a problem in urban and suburban areas. Um, so just keep that in mind when you're uh, thinking about uh, controlling these guys. So here's examples of publications that you can see on the IPM uh, site. So what are your management options uh, with these guys? The first is just habitat modification. So for um, ground squirrels, that means removing brush and debris piles because they favor these because uh, it gives them cover. The burrows can also be destroyed by deep ripping. Usually you have to rip down to about 20 inches to destroy uh, ground squirrel burrows. And make sure that whenever you're treating a burrow that it's an active ground squirrel burrow because that you see ground squirrels going in and out of it because abandoned ground squirrel burrows are sometimes uh, taken over by foxes and ground nesting owls and you wouldn't want to harm those animals. For tree squirrels uh, you can remove overhanging branches and this will help keep them off roofs of structures and then fruit and nut trees can be netted to try to exclude squirrels, but uh, that can be impractical if the tree is large. Uh, next, you have trapping, and there's several different kinds of traps available, uh, live traps and kill traps. And we don't recommend using live traps because if you catch the animal live, then you're, you have, you have a dilemma with what you're gonna do with it. It's illegal to relocate uh, such an animal off of your property. So you basically have to either let it go, which defeats the whole purpose of why you caught it, or you have to euthanize it. And there's strict laws about how animals can be euthanized. For example, you can't drown animals. It's, it's illegal because it's cruel. So keep that in mind. So the kill traps are usually what uh, are recommended. There are several different kinds. For ground squirrels, you would put these on the ground near the burrows. They would be baited with um, nuts, grain, or melon rinds. And then you would only do that when, tree, when ground squirrels are active, uh, February to October. For tree squirrels, you can use the same type of traps, but of course you would put them in trees or on rooftops. And then fumigation is an option for ground squirrel burrows. Uh, usually it's done in the spring when the soil is moist because it helps retain the fumigate in the burrow. Of course, that would not work for tree squirrels because they don't have burrows. And then finally, you have poison bait, anticoagulant bait. Now, this is a first generation anticoagulant that requires multiple doses. So you have to set up a tamper resistant bait station and the animal has to feed on that several times for the uh, bait to be effective. Uh, these are hazardous to other wildlife, to pets, and to children. So be very careful if you use anticoagulant bait. This can only be used for ground squirrels. It's actually illegal in California to use uh, poison anticoagulant bait for tree squirrels. All right, next we have pocket gophers, so-called because they have pockets in their mouths where they store food. You can see on the bottom picture, you can see his little cheeks puffing out there. Um, all right, this is an ex the top picture is an example of a gopher burrow opening. So compare this with the ground squirrel uh, opening. You can see that this opening is plugged with a soil plug. And there's a lot of excavated soil around the opening distributed in a fan shape or crescent like pattern. This is very typical for uh, gopher uh, burrow openings. They spend most of their time in the ground. Uh, they do come out of the burrow and can feed on plants around the burrow, but usually they don't stray much more than a body length or so away from the burrow. On the left is another excellent example of a gopher burrow opening. Again, a central plugged opening with a crescent shaped distribution of excavated soil. That's a gopher opening. Now they do the same damage that all these rodents do. They chew on all kinds of things. Uh, they can even chew on bark underground. So if you have a tree, for example, that looks like it's dying, you may wanna excavate down around the root crown to see if it's been girdled by a gopher underground. 
Uh, they also interfere a lot with tur managing turf grass areas uh, because these gopher mounds can bring in uh, weed seeds. All right, management strategies for gophers. Um, you can exclude them um, by putting underground fencing around areas you want to protect. So that means using something like hardware cloth, which you can get at the home store. It's like a wire mesh. Uh, and that needs to be buried in the ground about two feet deep. And then you leave about six inches or so uh, uh, sticking up. And you can put this also in the base of raised beds when you're first, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, raised beds when you're first starting before you fill them up with soil, you can put cardboard cloth in the base to keep gophers out. And you can actually plant plants in wire cages, wire baskets, and that can help uh, keep uh, gophers out. And then uh, what people often end up doing that are frustrated with gopher uh, damage is trapping them. So uh, to do that, you need to locate the main, one of the main underground tunnels, not the shallow surface feeding tunnels. And to do that, you use something called a gopher probe, which is just a long metal spike. And you push that in the ground, searching for this tunnel. As the spike suddenly gives way, you know that you've entered the tunnel. You would excavate that area put the gopher trap into the main tunnel and then cover it over. Uh, check it frequently. And if you haven't caught the gopher in, in a day or two, you need to uh, move it to a different main tunnel area. It's also a good idea to wire the trap to a stake uh, so that it doesn't get carried off by a predator that may be trying to scavenge the, uh, the dead uh, gopher. Now, whenever you're disposing of dead animals, it's important not to touch them with your bare hands. They can carry diseases. For example, ground squirrels have been known to carry bubonic plague and uh, tree squirrels can carry tularemia. So the best way to dispose of them is to put a thick bag over your hand, a plastic bag, and then grab the animal and then turn the bag inside out and seal it. That way you've never touched the animal with your hands. And then go ahead and wash your hands real good uh, once you're done with that. All right, uh, fumigation can also be used for uh, pocket gopher control. The smoke and gas cartridges that you get at the home stores are usually not effective, that effective uh, because they just don't put out a big volume of uh, fumigant. So what works best is actually a pressurized gas exhaust system that pumps carbon monoxide into the burrow. These are expensive devices, so typically you'd hire a pest control uh, professional to, to do that. And then uh, there is bait available for gophers, uh, but this has to be put underground. And as we mentioned before, uh, this is hazardous to other animals, uh, pets, and children. Uh, the bait has to be placed underground in the main tunnel. It's illegal and ineffective to place it on the surface of the soil. And then you may see a whole bunch of other things like frightening devices and repellents and owl boxes to try to attract gopher predators. None of these things uh, are proven to work, so it's best to avoid those. All right, next we have moles. Moles are not rodents. They feed on insects and worms. So if you see mole activity and you're having a lot of plant material being damaged, it's probably not the mole. I have moles in my garden and I usually just leave them alone. Uh, here's an example of a mole burrow opening, a mole mound. Um, in contrast with the gopher mound, the opening is in the center. It is also plugged but the distribution of excavated soil is in a cone, like a volcano with the opening in the middle. So that's one good way to distinguish between gophers and moles. Also, the lower photo shows one of these shallow linear mounds, which is just a very shallow tunnel that moles dig. You may see these, uh, particularly this time of year when the soil uh, is moist and easily uh, excavated. Uh, for mole control, usually the best method is trapping them. So uh, it would be the same procedure as with the gopher, but there are special traps uh, for moles. Uh, but you can use a gopher probe to try to locate the hole 
and then set the trap uh, in the active tunnel. There is also bait, anticoagulant toxic bait available for moles. Uh, but again, this has to be uh, placed directly in the tunnel. It's specific for moles. Gopher bait usually won't work because that's based on grain and moles don't eat grain. So if you're gonna use it, you need to get the correct one. And then uh, again, you may see repellents available in home stores or garden stores, and these have not really been shown to work. So it's best to avoid those. And then finally, we have voles, not moles, but voles. Uh, these are also called meadow mice, and they're a little bit bigger than a house mouse, but they're rodents too. They chew on everything, and they have a very unusual fluctuation in their populations in many places. They often will persist at low levels and then suddenly increase their population incredibly. So you may have times when there are thousands of voles per acre. When this happens, it's going to be very difficult to control them, but they can be controlled by the other methods that we've talked about, such as habitat modification. In this case, it would be removing weeds, deep mulch, dense vegetation, and keeping a grass mode. This deters moles from, uh, voles from moving in. They can be excluded with things like hardware cloth, but typically you need to use smaller diameter uh, cloth, a quarter inch or so. Uh, they can be trapped. Uh, you use mouse traps. Usually they don't even have to be baited. Uh, there is anticoagulant bait available for voles, but again, it's put on the surface of the soil. So it has some danger associated with it. And then uh, there are repellents that are not effective that you may see in the store. There's gas cartridge fumigants that are sometimes sold for voles. And these are also not very effective because as you can see in the bottom left, these burrow openings, they have lots of burrow openings. So the fumigant just disperses uh, very rapidly. So for the vole burrow opening, you can see that it's open, it's not plugged, and usually there's not a lot of excavated soil, but the burrow openings are connected by these runways. You can see them uh, on the right, the lower right picture there, that's a runway and you may see fecal pellets uh, in those runways. So that, those are voles. And then there's other rodents, of course, uh, rats and uh, deer mice and, and others. So if you have trouble with other uh, rodents, you can just go to the UC uh, Pest Note site and they will help you out. All right, well, that's it for rodents. I'm gonna turn it over now to Master Gardener T.C. Markle and she'll talk to you about other vertebrate pests. T.C. Thank you, Lauren. Let me get my show here. Right. Um, you probably recognize jackrabbits by their large, long ears. They're actually hares and not rabbits. They tend to eat succulent green vegetation, as well as grasses and herbaceous plants. They especially like the bark of young trees. Oops. Cottontails are smaller in size and have much shorter ears. They generally inhabit places with dense cover, like wooded areas or blackberry bushes. A good sign that rabbits are present is coarse brown fecal droppings. Jackrabbit pellets are about half inch in diameter, whereas cottontail pellets are closer to a quarter inch in diameter. How to manage these pests? Well, the first method is physical exclusion. The most effective way is to build a fence. Poultry netting supported by light stakes may be sufficient, although the mesh size should be no larger than one inch in order to exclude young rabbits. It's a good idea to bury the bottom of the wire at least 10 inches into the ground. Rabbits tend to gnaw smooth, thin bark from young trees. So trunk guards may be useful when trees have tender bark. As far as habitat management goes, remove brambles, and piles of brush or stone where rabbits can hide. Keep in mind that vegetation management can affect other wildlife such as songbirds. Okay, we have raccoons and opossums. Raccoons prefer wooded areas near water and natural habitat. 
This nocturnal animal adapts well to urban and suburban environments where it often it dens beneath decks or in outbuildings. Attics and chimneys might be used also. Raccoons are omnivorous, eating both plants and animals. They will eat fruit, berries, nuts, acorns, and corn. Pet food left out overnight ranks high as a food source. They are especially fond of chicken eggs. Same with eating from garbage cans and compost piles. Common problems occur when raccoons look for nesting sites in buildings, even going so far as to tear off shingles or fascia boards to gain entry. The first way to deter them is habitat modification. Use garbage cans with secure lids. Use bungee cords or wire to tie the can to a secure post to keep it from being tipped over. Pick up any fallen fruit often. Tree branches that overhang your roof should be trimmed back to reduce roof and attic access. Exclusion is the key to eliminating raccoons. They have hand-like front paws and are very dexterous and they have been known to unhook simple latches. Cover chimneys with spark arresters. Open spaces beneath decks, porches, and outbuildings should be tightly screened with 10 gauge, one quarter to one third inch galvanized hardware mesh. Bury the bottom six inches deep, extend out 12 inches, and then bury with soil. If trapping becomes necessary, it is recommended that a professional be called in. It is prohibited by law to trap and release the animals elsewhere. The opossum is the only North American marsupial. They are skilled climbers due to, due to their opposable thumbs on their back feet. They like to live in old animal burrows, tree cavities, or brush piles. In urban areas, they may den under porches, decks, garden sheds, etc. They make an untidy nest of sticks. The opossum is a nocturnal omnivore visiting vegetable gardens, compost piles, garbage cans, and pet food left out overnight. They have even been known to enter homes through pet doors. Although they carry many diseases, they do perform helpful jobs like eating ticks, snails, and slugs, rats, and mice, and roadkill. Control methods are similar to raccoons, so if they become a nuisance, follow the same exclusion guidelines as for raccoons. Motion activated sprinkler devices rarely work for long with any of these visitors and they, because they habituate to their use. Numerous home remedies such as mothballs, blood meal and ammonia, etc., have been tried. These don't work and their use in this manner is actually illegal. The fumes could also harm, harm humans and these chemicals may also build up toxicity in the soil. All right, now we have skunks. As with the previous two mammals, skunks will den under decks, porches, sheds, and homes. They like to feed on ripening berries, fruits, and bird seed. They will scrounge in compost piles for food scraps, so a hot rather than a cold compost pile is recommended. They also get into garbage cans. Lawn damage can be caused by skunks digging for grubs and other insects. You can see that in the photo on the top. There may be small pits or cone-shaped depressions that range from three to five inches across. If your lawn is infested with insects or grubs, see the pest note called lawn insects or call the Placer County Master Gardener hotline. Oops, sorry, I did that too soon. <laughs> Skunks actually prefer not to spray and will warn you by, um, before spraying by stamping their feet vigorously, hissing and arching their backs. Exclusion methods are again recommended as with raccoons and opossums. The skunk's pest note gives excellent instructions in case they have already taken up residence under your home or have a den with babies there. Call a professional trapper to remove skunks because of the potential for rabies. It is illegal to relocate skunks without a permit. 
a physician should be promptly contacted to check out any skunk bite, no matter how minor. Skunks that seem tame or wander about during daylight hours should be treated with great caution as this behavior is symptomatic of rabies. There is no registered toxicant for poisoning skunks. Fear can be very destructive to home gardens, ornamental landscape plants, orchards, and vineyards. They can completely consume veggie gardens. Clues to deer presence include hoof prints two to three inches long, split in the middle, pointed at the front edge, and more rounded in the back. Piles of small jelly bean shaped droppings may be evident. Another clue to deer presence is the tearing of leaves and stems, leaving ragged edges on the remaining plant parts. In mid to late summer, the bucks will rub their antlers on tree trunks, limbs, and fence posts, etc., to remove their shedding velvet. While not a big problem to larger trees, saplings and small limbs can be badly damaged or destroyed. There are lists of deer resistant plants, but there are truly very few deer proof plants. Properly built and maintained fencing is the most effective method for preventing deer damage. These fences should be seven to eight feet tall. In many places, protecting individual plants is more practical than fencing an entire area. Frightening devices usually only work for a few days, then the deer adapt to them. Various chemical repellents are sold to make plants smell or taste bad to deer. To be effective, they must usually be applied to new foliage after it develops or be reapplied after rain. Several bird species can cause substantial damage by feeding on ripening fruit and nuts. Often early ripening fruit species such as cherries are the most extensively damaged. It is important to identify which species is doing the damage. Check out the pest note called Birds on Tree Fruits and Vines for bird photos and descriptions of eating habits. Regular weekly monitoring of bird activity in your yard is key to reducing damage so that you may begin management actions. If you have had significant fruit damage in the past, start keeping records of bird visits and approximate numbers as fruit begins to ripen. Look for any that is damaged or has been knocked from the tree. Protective netting is the most effective way to reduce bird damage to small orchards and isolated trees. When using frightening devices, the most effective way is to use a combination of noisemakers and visual deterrents. For maximum effectiveness, rotate from one type of device to another, changing your tactics every few days as the birds habituate to your choices. Birds can often be controlled by shooting. It is necessary to obtain a depredation permit for certain species. So check the pest notes and with your county authorities as regulations can change. The only birds that may be trapped and destroyed without a permit are starlings. Commercial repellents are currently registered for use on edible fruits such as cherries, apples, blueberries, and grapes. Results are mixed, however. So we have options when dealing with vertebrate pests. Biological control can be challenging, but depending on your, where you live and how large your property is, they, they may help. You may in encourage predator help, let's say by putting up an owl box. Cultural control refers to modifying the habitat. For example, by removing brush piles where mammals may hide or make dens. Physical controls include keeping unwanted critters out by using wire barriers, traps, or frightening animals with noise or visual deterrence. And chemical controls were discussed by Lauren and those have certain rules and regulations that need to be followed. And of course, with both the physical and the chemical controls, you, re, that requires that you correctly identify which pest you have. As we have discussed, certain different options are available for different types of pests. This chart illustrates the point. You need to correctly identify your pests first. If you have squirrels, for instance, 
you need to know if they are tree squirrels or ground squirrels as the control options are different. You can view this chart later too because our um, presentation is being recorded on our YouTube channel. So there's no magic answer. You need to know which management option is more effective for the pest you have. You are allowed to legally shoot some pests in California. Check to see if the animal is the game species. Do you need a license and is it legal in your area? We have touched on the use of traps and which ones are recommended for various pests. Remember that it is illegal to translocate wildlife or bring it somewhere else. In addition, some of these pests carry diseases and parasites, which could then be spread to new animal populations. Hiring a professional may be a better choice for removal. For information about managing vertebrate pests and other pests of homes, gardens, landscapes, and turf, visit the UCIPM website at ipm.ucanr.edu. This is the end of our presentation. I'll turn it back to our moderator, Shelley. Thank you for attending. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, TC and Lauren. Well, I see you did such a great job that we don't have any questions in the question, but I do have a few comments from our other master gardeners. Peggy says, you can contact the Placer County Trapper to get help with raccoon trappings. And then Rebecca, says Michigan State University did a study of raccoon deterrence and found strobe lights worked well. We tried it and it worked. Out, outdoor strobe lights were found on Amazon. <clears throat> Thanks again to Lauren and TC, our presenters today. And I want to remind all of you that you can find the link to this recorded workshop soon at pcmg.ucanr.org under upcoming events and check the listings for our future virtual workshops. Please remember that if you live in another county, state, or area of the world, you should consult local master gardeners or other experts about geographical climatic differences in your garden. Thank you for participating today and we hope to see you at a future presentation. Thank you very much. It was very informative. Donna, are you having trouble with, oh, there we go. Few more uh, comments in the chat. Well, I can answer Barbara's. Yeah, the pricey sonic tube. Right. Pricey sonic tubes I bought won't work or po on pocket gophers. We that is true. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, TC. <laughs> Yeah.
in Marilyn Jasper says, careful with bird netting. It also traps and kills beneficial species such as birds eating insects, lizards, etc. When used in ponds, netting can trap beneficial snakes. Does anybody know if this? They can be saved and cut free, but only if they can keep their noses above the water. They get exhausted. Dan White here. I had a, a beautiful king snake trapped in some netting on the ground in my vegetable garden. And he was mad at me when I tried to snip him away with scissors, but he finally left. Good work. Good to know. <laughs> you want to stop recording?